Hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Soft Bulk September. It's good to see folks from far as Scotland and as close as Flatbush, New York. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I see a neighbor in the crowd. Oh, well, welcome, everybody. Which isn't close. It's hard as heck to get there. <laughs> for me. <laughs> so we are so excited today to have our friend Mara Ambrose with us of Folk Fibers, who's going to share some of what she's been working on. But first, we want to give you a chance to type in the chat and say, one, where you're from, and two, have you ever worked with natural dyes before? Let us know in the chat. Dan! Hello from Milwaukee. I got a neighbor in the group, too. Nice. <laughs> Say that one more time though, Zach, where you're from and... Where you're from and do you have any experience with natural dyes? Mm. I have limited experience. I've done a lot with, I've done a little bit with indigo. I've done some oak galls because they're all over the ground here in the Northeast. And yeah. acorn also. A pretty savvy natural dyer, Zach. I mean... You're not a master at it, but I would say like pretty savvy. Here, here's the tea though, here's the tea, is that I had to um, stop doing all my natural dye experiments because we have a small apartment and natural dyes, as folks who work with them know, have a certain aroma. Yeah. They can be pleasant or they can be surprisingly unpleasant. And so I just decided while I'm in a small apartment, maybe natural oh, dye. Did the neighbors have a problem or just Travis? Oh, just a sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when you start filling the bathtub up with indigo when they start having. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I've only experimented mostly with natural dye of like coffee right here and, you know, maybe like a taco stain, <laughs> uh, like an accent mark. <laughs> um, well, honestly, I haven't even broken out the dyes since March. So I go like really long, like since having children, I, I'll do a lot of dying and then take like six months off just because I have what I need. Um, I don't like, I don't do it a lot because I am a natural dyer for making things with my fabric. I, I, you know, I want to mo move into the like making part. Um, so it's, it's not like I'm always dying fabric. Because that's a vision that we have of you in our minds. At least I do. Yeah. That more has always got like blue hands. Right, or something. Like always like forearm down is like color of the week. That's yeah. <laughs> Well, like my friend Liz, um, the dog with dyer, she's like, I think that persona, like she's always dying every day of her life. and. Um, in my head, in my heart, I am, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to make things with my fabric. And um, yeah, I kind of, I'm just like a, yeah, bulk, bulk dyer. Mm -hmm. You know, so even though I, I've sort of made the joke about only dying by spilling on myself, I did a single experiment with indigo. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that sort of this afternoon. So I won't, or this morning rather, so I won't go too much. But I, I still have fabric from that. And that was probably five or six years ago. I died, you know, 300 yards at once. And I still have, you know, even though it was over the course of two weekends, I still have fabric. So like, <laughs> so I feel you, you don't need to, you don't need to make small batches every day to have everything that you need. Mm -hmm. um, are you, you really mean 300 yards or 30? No, no, I meant 300 yards. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Luke likes to do things big. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but yeah. 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 The okay. grand okay. scale is the only scale for Luke. Same yeah. as like, you, don't, you don't trim your hair. You, you cut it all off. Right. More of my hair was down to, down to here yesterday, so. Okay, I was going to say, in, I watched the March, the first, Soft and your hair was so haircut. I'm kind of going back to March, so there's a lot that could happen. It was recent. <laughs> yeah, last night. That was a particular um, beautiful hairstyle. Great, All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. folks, what do you say we go ahead and get started? We got a good crew here with us this morning. 
I thought we'd do a round of introductions first, and then we have a game we're going to play. If you've ever listened to the podcast, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, uh, we've based the game on that. So we're going to ask for a volunteer here in just a minute who feels like they know what the four of us have been up to in the last week or so via Instagram, social media, et cetera. If you answer three out of the four questions correctly, there's two pretty awesome prizes coming your way, but we'll tell you about that in a second. So be thinking about if you want to volunteer. But I'll introduce myself first and then we'll just go around the circle. Um, I'm Zach Foster for folks who haven't met me before. Uh, I make a lot of modern quilts, a lot of repurposed materials. I specialize in memory quilts, burial quilts, and funeral quilts. One of those I'll share with you here today because I have a, a new design I'm piloting. And a special thank you for all the patrons in my Patreon community who are making this textile journey not only possible, but very exciting. So this is a, it's a good place to be. I thank you for being with me. Heidi? All right, I am Heidi Parks. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I do a lot of hand quilting, um, mostly hand piecing, sometimes machine piecing. I've been getting a little bit more into that lately. And I do a lot of teaching. So this month in September on the 20th with the full moon, the harvest moon, I have a quilt along that's beginning for a pattern called the vignettes quilt. I also have some other workshops coming up. One is a self hosted class on small scale framed quilts. So I'm gonna be I shared about, yes, that's one I made for my friend Zach. And so that coming up. And I have also some classes coming with Madeline Island School of the Arts and the Makery. And um, I was a high school art teacher for nine years before I shifted to quilting. Uh, and so I still love to teach. Luke. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. <everybody. laughs> um, I'm Luke Haynes. Um, I saw a fellow Kansas Cityan holler in the in the chat there. So hello, hope you're enjoying the rain as well. Um, I'm a quilter, exclusively machine, unlike Heidi. I don't know where there's a hand sewing needle in my studio. Um, I, I probably have one on accident <laughs> from a gift <laughs> somewhere. Um, but uh, I come from architecture and I have this sort of uh, my ethos in, in sort of art and, and architecture is that there's a conversation with machine that I can make objects faster than I could on my own. And I find that to be fascinating. So for me, I like the conversation of kind of what can the machine do better than me? And then we can make something together. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's kind of why I'm a machine user. Plus, I always poke myself. So <laughs> if I, you know, even when I'm loading on the long arm, I poke myself nearly every time. So I guess it's just also, uh, you know, uh, me and the needles have a, a bit of a version. I'd make a very good Cinderella. No, which is the one, Sleeping Beauty. She's the one who poked herself. I'd be, I'd be sleeping a lot. Um, <laughs> so anyway, Maura? Hi, I'm Mar Ambrose. I am in Bastrop, Texas, which is just about 30, 40 minutes from Austin, Texas. And we moved out here eight years. We lived in Austin first. And um, I became a quilter. I guess you just become that. Um, when I went to college at Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia, I studied fibers and you know, you go through the whole rigmarole of all of it from like carding wool to dyeing it, to weaving it, sewing and all of it. And it was natural dyes that hooked me first um, because we had to learn the commercial dyes and to compare them with the natural dyes was just like so much more emotion and depth and that like painterly feeling. So I started like that is where I like, embedded my love for fabric. Um, there's, you know, of course, threads that go back to childhood with grandma's attic and stuff, but like, that's where I decided to go forward professionally. And quilting was also something I learned in college. Um, I didn't learn it from like grandma or family member, though aunts and stuff have been in my family that have done that. And um, I think of my college professor, Pamela Wiley, as like, my grandma, you know, like she taught in a small intimate classroom with like 
nine people and it was super conceptual, uh, deep conceptions of what are quilts. And that's what got me so excited about joining this conversation is that first softball conversation brought me back to that quilt class of like, let's talk about what is a quilt and like what it means and how it brings out like everything about life. And, um, and I took a break after college by doing like the day job thing and trying to keep a studio practice. Always, always an artist after going to art school, I felt that was something I could really claim. Um, but it wasn't until I took this like four month road trip that I was like ready to commit. I worked on farm preschools and like a creative corporate job, but kind of ready to like, I always said I never wanted to be my own boss. Like I was like, that does not sound appealing. But when I cut back from traveling around the Mississippi river and stuff, it was, uh, it was apparent to me like how passionate I felt I wanted to spend my time doing something I loved and um, not doing it as a side job. And so I gave myself a chance um, and three months later landed like a partnership with Levi's. And that's really how I launched my business back in 2011, you know? So it was, uh, it was a really fun, wild ride, um, snowball of press and it was exciting. Um, and then I became a mom and things kind of just like have been, it's, it's life. It's like ebbs and flows, hills and valleys. And I'm still a working artist. Some days I like, can I say that? Cause I didn't, haven't, you know, really connected with my art in like months. Um, but I built a studio. So gosh darn it, I'm getting back to work. You are making things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank yeah. you. I mean, I, I guess I could say one thing about that is I, I started in my living room on like a Pergo floor um, in a rental house. And I was really confused by friends who needed to buy studios or rent studios to like get started. I was like, I mean, I don't know. You just kind of go. You just put your sewing machine on a table and you go. <laughs> and that's how I got started. I mean, that Levi's partnership in like a couple years of extreme extraordinarily busy times where I even had my husband being my like assistant and partner in the business. Um, I was always in a living room on a table. Like it wasn't like a bedroom or, or a spare bedroom. You know, I, I upgraded to a spare bedroom with a door. Um, I just sort of like got displaced over the years. I had like always that spare bedroom going for me. And then we had two kids and now I renovated the garage is where I'm at now. And it's like a so fancy of a studio. It feels like a showroom, which is great because now I can invite people in and feel like I'm presenting my work on a professional level, which always was a little bit downer of the spare bedroom for me. <laughs> so. I think that's brilliant. And I'm looking forward to hear more about that story. More. Okay. <laughs> you got a lot going on. Yeah. Let's, let's segue to our game. If you think you'd like to participate, I'm just going to ask you to raise your digital hand. There's a button down there at the bottom. Smiley face reactions. reactions. Yeah. Look at the smiley face yeah. reactions. Raise your hand if you want to play. Yeah. Here are the rules of the game. Oh. Luke, Heidi, Moore, and myself, we each have one question about recent things in our lives. If you think you've been paying close attention in the last week or so, jump in and you could win, if you get three out of four questions correct, two fabulous prizes. Heidi, you wanna tell them the first one? Um, I'm gonna be sharing a digital copy of my vignettes quilt, the one that we are doing a quilt along for on the 20th, and Mara. I am going to share um, a free workshop that is how to make a quilt from start to finish. And it's a lifetime membership. So it's kind of a big giveaway, but I'm excited to share it. I mean, and I've seen snippets of the videos on your website more. They look beautiful. Uh, All thanks. right. So to keep it fair, I see we have four hands raised. I'm just going to eeny, meeny, miny, mo you. So here we go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a tiger by its toe, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. Unmute yourself, Marilyn. Jump in the game. Good morning. Or Hi. Evening. Good afternoon. Good it's afternoon. About, yeah, it's about <laughs> quarter to five here. And where it's is much here? more agreeable <laughs> time across the pond. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So Marilyn. 
You ready to play our game? I'll try. Okay. Question number one will be my question for you. This week, I made a flag from which of the following countries? Which one out of these three? The United States, Afghanistan, Haiti. To Afghanistan. Ding, ding, ding. You got one point, Marilyn. <laughs> I can Okay, I'll go up next. Um, I have been a quilter for how many years? 13, 10, or eight? Eight. Well done. Oh, yeah, oh it's good. my quilt anniversary. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'll go next and I'm going to take us on a little journey because the question from me is what is the name of my big hat? She's upstairs. Oh my God, I was gonna ask the name of my dog who is hiding from <gasps> Uh, being uh, in, in on TV, she's she's a very shy, very large, tiny, 140 pound girl. Um, so <laughs> the question is, what is her name? Is it zucchini, honeydew, or cantaloupe? Honeydew. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Marilyn, you've already won our prize, but you know what? <laughs> I think we can go four for four. Yeah. <laughs> Is this a bonus? <laughs> Maura? Maura, you oh. ready to ask your question? Sorry, I I'm, I'm, I'm thought Zach was going to ask for me. <laughs> so, Marilyn, what is the prominent color in my work in this season of life? What are the three options to go? OK, red, yellow, or blue? Blue. Yes. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn, you did a fantastic job. So reach out to Heidi and Maura after Softbook, maybe via okay. email. Is that the best way? Yeah. Send us an email. Let us know why it, that you were the winner, and we'll send you that digital file. Yes. Okay, this, thank you. Thank Beautiful. you. Love you. <laughs> Thanks for playing, Marilyn. It's good to see you. Mm -hmm. so fun. Okay. All right. So here we are. Soft bulk. This is our last summer session. After this, it's going to be soft bulk fall, I guess, when we come see you next time. <laughs> um, we're just going to chat for the next little while about what we're working on. And I would like to jump in, if that's all right, and get us started with a couple of quilts that I've been working on this week. So I'll share my screen and I'm going to give you a close up of the tabletop here. Okay, we're going to start with this one. Yeah, I want to know more about it. I've been seeing yeah. it. Well, I had to kind of crowdsource some tips for this one. Let's go full screen. Here we go. Hopefully, y'all can see that fairly well. Okay, so the backstory to this quote is that I have a good friend that runs a school in Uganda. And when I moved to New York over a decade ago, that's when she left North Carolina and moved to Uganda to start this school. And She's doing, the school's doing phenomenal. I mean, it's doing really, really well. And they have a fundraiser coming up this fall. And she says, Zach, would you mind making a quilt? I said, no problem. So we just, the stars aligned that both of us were going to be in Montana at the same time this summer. Her family's originally from Montana. And we were their visiting family. And so she brought back eight yards of material of African wax print-esque, because this stuff was probably printed in China, I'm guessing, um, fabric from Uganda. And... I looked at it and I'm just like, holy cow, I have never worked with such bold prints before. And in fact, I, um, I was a little bit intimidated. I've been intimidated by bold prints for a long time. I mean, for me, like going crazy would be like some little like calico thing or something. <laughs> <laughs> that was wild I ever went pattern wise. Um, but I like a challenge, you know, like I always want to push myself to try something new. And so I reached out online. I'm like, folks, give me some tips for... Uh, working with such bold prints. And two of them really were helpful. And so I want to pass those along to you. The first one, actually, Heidi, came from you, which oh. is the idea to step back as far as you can from the print so that you stop seeing the print so close and you get all caught up in those details and just envision it like a hole, which it takes, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet to be able to, to wrap your brain around it. So that was a really helpful hint. And the other helpful hint was said by a few different folks. I know um, Noelle's Buster, if you're here, you said it, but a few different people said that consider the scale of the print and try to reduce it to its 
I guess in math, we call it the lowest common denominator, right? In this case, if you were to look at what I consider the background print, the one that has all the yellow circles on it, um, I wouldn't want to cut one of those yellow circles in, in two. You know, like I was trying to leave those whole. A yellow circle for me was the lowest common denominator. Or for the big cross in the middle, the intersection, the lowest common denominator would have been one of those red waves. And so I tried to leave those things entire as I was cutting my fabric and working with it. And so what I think that does is it leaves the print intact. It leaves it readily identifiable as an African wax print, right? So there's no obfuscation. There's no like, let me try to transform this and make it something else. This is an African wax print and that's what it was designed as and that's what will remain. And so those two tips combined, stepping away and then figuring out the scale that is most appropriate for each print and it will be different for each print. We're probably my top two helpful guidelines or guiding thoughts when I was working on this project. So thank you for those. Um, the only other thing I would tell you about this particular quilt is that um, symbolically, they, it came from, I, I was researching mm, traditional wardrobe of Uganda, you know, because I wanted to have a tie to the place. And clicking through all the Google image searches, the thing that stood out to me over and over and over again, and that's how I knew I had to work with it, were these long floor length sashes, these belts that the women would wear that gather around their floor length gown dresses, and the sashes go from the waist down to their toes, just about, mm -hmm. right? So they're really long belts. Um, so I thought that as a symbol of something that mm, gathers all the folds of their dresses and supports the, the shape and the, the garment itself. I just thought that made a lovely mm, energy to work with when we're thinking about building a community around fundraising and keeping this school financially viable and all that. So that was where I was coming from with this. I think it's turned out fairly nice. I'm very happy with it. I'm very happy with it. Um, one thing we're going to do a little bit differently, and we forgot to mention that this, and I hope it's okay with my, my panelists here, is that normally we do question and answer at the end of the hour, but we're going to take about five minutes after each person, if you have questions to talk about specific projects. If you have questions about this, we can talk about it at that point in time. Then quickly, because I, I am seeing the time, this is a funeral quilt that I made for a client that I'm really intrigued by. And we were talking early on in the... Um, the, the planning phase of this, that she's gonna use this in the funeral, in the ceremony, maybe draped over the coffin or over the back of a pew, I'm not exactly sure what. But then she mentions to me, and Melanie, if you're here, hi. And then she mentions to me that she wants to pass along the quilt to her children afterwards. And I said, great, but how, how are you gonna pass along one quilt to two kids? And so that gave me the idea to start thinking along the lines of building a modular quilt. And so this quilt is going to divide along the equator, basically the horizontal bar, the plus. And I'm going to switch over and give you an idea. I've made a little mock-up that I just this morning that I wanted to share with you. So um, Heidi, do you need to share my phone? Is that how that works? Oh yeah. So let's have you stop screen sharing. Okay. And then you can mute yourself and right. and then unmute on the phone. And I'm going to find you. Zach, did you make that shirt too? Oh, we gotta mute us. <laughs> How about now? Um, Can you hear me? Well, so you need to have, you know, double mute. So make sure no sound is coming out of your computer, as well as, like, you're not muted on your computer right How now. How about now? Let me mute you. There. Okay. There you go. Um, We're good. I think so. Let's wait. Here's the other Philip Foster. <laughs> okay, we got you. Okay, so that's my ceiling fan, hi. That's not what I'm here to show you though. So I thought it might just be easier to show you um, here on the tabletop. So I made this for us this morning because I've been trying to explain to people what I wanna do and words just don't cut it. So I thought maybe a visual would help. So here I took two of my tiny quilts that I've made and so just imagine that this quilt can separate, right? It's two separate pieces. And so I am securing it in three different ways. So I think on the back of the quilt, I'm gonna have, you know, a thicker fabric, maybe like a light canvas strip, maybe about six inches wide or so, that will attach to the only the back. You won't see these stitches through the front and it'll attach to both sides. 
that'll secure the backs together. But then if I did just that, it would be very floppy, right? And you would have this opening. So then I think I'll also take maybe like a, a thin ribbon or something and wrap it around the binding to secure the top. And this binding, my plan is to, to almost pattern match. So to make the binding so that it's uh, basically invisible, so you don't see it, so it doesn't interrupt the plus sign that's gonna be in the middle of, of the larger quilt. Um, and then it'll all be in such a way that, you know, I'll be using contrasting threads and stitches so that the family will know well, these, are the, these are the stitches I cut to, to, to separate this into two separate quilts. That's the idea, at least. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna come back to my other camera now. That does make sense. Okay, I'm going to put our spotlights back to the four of us. All right. All right. How are we now? Zach, hear me? Zach, your microphone might still be on on the uh, telephone. How about now? Good? Okay. That's good for me. <laughs> so that's it. That's what I've been working on these days. Um, that big print, that bold print for the, the charity, and then this modular funeral quilt that will one day be two quilts. It'll multiply. So thank you for letting me share that with you. If you got any questions or suggestions about like, maybe, you, maybe you're looking at this and you're like, Zach, have you considered X, Y, Z? Please let me know. Well, I mean, I just want to interject and give you a little space to tell us or tell me the difference between uh, memory quilt, burial quilt, and funeral quilt. I think that there's probably a, a, an important distinction, but I personally don't know. Yeah, well, I'll put it to you like this. So for me, memory quilts, I think when most people think of memory quilts, we think of quilts made from clothing of a loved one that's passed away. They can also be uh, quilts made from clothes you don't wear anymore, but that come from a time of life that you want to memorialize. Maybe, maybe you worked a nine to five job for 18 years and you're like, I don't need those clothes anymore. Let me make a quilt out of them, right? Or maybe you want to make uh, quilts out of your kids' clothes, right? They're all grown up now. They're off to college. Maybe that's a memory quilt you want to make. Then Funeral quilts, to differentiate them, to contrast them with burial quilts, funeral quilts are designed to be used just in the ceremony and then to be passed along to a family member, right? So they stay above ground, so to speak. Burial quilts, as the name imply, go underground with the body. They're used oftentimes in lieu of a casket. Um, the idea being that we're just one big organic salad, folks. This body that our spirit inhabits is an organic salad and I want this stuff to return to the earth. And that's difficult to do in a, in a varnished box, right? So wrap me up in a soft quilt, stick me in the ground and let, let the earth feast, you know? Um, that's a burial quilt for you. And so that's in my mind, the distinctions of those three. How many have you made? How many burial quilts have you made? Well, this has been an idea that I've been stewing on for several years, but I've only really launched it in the last like six months. So two. It, no, it's rad. Um, I have a friend who was a MIT science art kind of hybrid and she, friend, I, I know of her, um, and she did um, mushroom spore bags for natural burials. So pretty cool. Yeah, I would love to find a way to incorporate mushroom spores into the quilts. The problem yeah. with that is that, well, then you couldn't really wash the quilts at any point while you're alive, right? Because burial quilts, I think one of the beautiful things is that you, all can, you can use them and enjoy them while you're living, right? I've got my burial quilt back in my bedroom and it, having its presence in my daily life mm. adds a certain grounding, right? To the day, like I'm like, I can curl up in you now and one day I'm really gonna curl up in you. And it, <laughs> I, it just yeah. gives me a longer view of things, right? Mm -hmm. It takes away some of the mystery about something that is so ultimately mysterious. No, totally. I have friends that have property here in Bastrop and um, dug their own graves already. <laughs> wow. I know, in a beautiful, happy way. They were laughing, yeah, awesome. having a great time, you know, with their best friends. And Yeah, my thing is, look, it's going to happen. 100%. All of us will not be one of these days. So 
we know it's going to happen. Let's let's plan our party the way we want our party to go, mm -hmm. right? We have some control over it now. We won't after the fact. I have another question. Yeah. Have you been approached often for t-shirt quilts? Uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you say? To I usually, well, usually when people are looking for t-shirt quilts that they have in mind, like the, the squares, they're just like that straight up grid that so often gets made. Um, I usually refer them to a friend of mine back home that does that exclusively. Although I will say the t-shirt memory quilts that Sherry Lynn Woods has been making recently are stunning. So I think the next person who asks me for a t-shirt memory quilt, I might say yes and just have fun. Try. Okay. Yeah. Love it. I'm going to have to look at her. Thanks for saying that because mm -hmm. I didn't know she was doing that. Y'all, I'm not with i'm like still in my mom fog i don't know what's going on it's good i i'm not like hyper into like my phone and my computer and the internet but telling me that i'm like that's awesome she's doing that yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have yeah when you get to what is it episode like number three or number four okay then, then you'll see Sherry <laughs> would hear all about it with us <laughs> uh, zach you have a couple questions in the chat um okay. Uh, do you have special considerations for the materials from a burial quilt perspective since it will go into the ground? 100%. Who asked that question? Uh, Lucia. Lucia, thank you for that question because for me it is so important that if it's going back in the ground that it be natural fiber, preferably organic, and preferably natural dye, right? Because we don't want anything that's going to... Look, our bodies, we accumulate metals and junk as we go through the through our lives right and that's got to be broken down but i'm not trying to take any extra junk into the ground with me so i try to keep it as natural as possible even down to sourcing 100 percent cotton uh thread for the long arm machine loop because it can be hard to find a good cotton long arm thread that doesn't snap and fray just because of the pressure that's under industrially um found one of those so even down to the thread i'm using natural fibers mm. Interesting. Very good. Thank you all for letting me share that and for your questions. I appreciate it. I would like to, at this point, pass the baton over the, to my friend Heidi there. All right. Hear what you've been up to. To share my screen. Um, right, setting. Okay. So I'm excited to share a little bit about my quilt anniversary. my eight year quilt anniversary of making a fabric quilt. And I feel like this is a fun picture that I took September, 2013 to just know like, who was this Heidi that started making quilts? So um, here I am at Expo Chicago at uh, Navy Pier and interacting with some very fancy fine art where I like popped my head up into this little botanical thing. And I was a high school art teacher at the time and had my students on a field trip there. And I also was a very hard year for me. So this cake says happy Saturday because a friend of mine and I were watching, doing sad movie Saturday <laughs> as kind of a regular event where we would like watch romantic sad movies and cry and feel like sad that our lives weren't turning out the way we wanted them to. And um, you know, especially in that romantic sense and even thinking about the live that Mara and I did yesterday, like there was a time where I really wanted to be a mother and my partner and I had the names for our children picked out and that didn't work out for me. And it's interesting being in a field that has so many parents with quilting that I feel like that's one of the few places where I do frequently feel like a minority within our community like I'm not in that majority um, and so anyways that was something that I was really processing at the time and I didn't feel like I had something to be excited about instead of um, that so during my sad movie Saturdays I started to make this woven bench and my dad and I turned the legs on this together with the lathe and then I used a bunch of old fabric that I had especially donated to me or not donate, but I received it from my former next door neighbor who had passed away. And she, I got like an eighth of the fabric and it was so much. <laughs> I still have lots of fabric from Jean. So I was 
ripping it into strips and using my drop spindle and making um, this yarn to wrap around the bench and working with that kind of repetitive textile making process was really soothing and helped to kind of calm some of that sadness that I was feeling. And when that project was done, I was looking for something else to work on. Something else that I'd been doing a lot of at the time was embroidery. Certainly I felt like textiles were my thing, uh, but I had never made a fabric quilt. If you look at my Instagram recently, I'd made a quilt out of a book, I'd made a metal quilt, no hand quilted fabric quilts. So my grandmother bought this quilt top at an estate sale for $37 and 50 cents. Cause that's what the tag said probably de a decade prior and put it in a Tupperware and never did anything with it. And my mom was cleaning her stuff out and helping her downsize at the time and said, Hey, Heidi, you just moved out of our house. I lived with my mom till I was 30. <laughs> so I had moved out. I was in my own apartment and I thought, yeah, I do want to make a blanket. So I started with this and then I added, I didn't have a great big piece of fabric for the back of the quilt. So I thought I'll just quilt in a, a quilt top. And by the end of, I began it last couple days of August and finished the quilt in September and just fell completely in love with quilting. So this bottom corner right here, I made this hand embroidered tag about how my mom, my grandmother was helpful and I was inspired by G's Bend. And it's like wild to look at my stitches there. I was using the polyester hand quilting quilt from Joanne Fabric, thread from Joanne Fabrics because that's what it looked like I was supposed to use at the store. And um, it was just so, so special to work on. I really love how this flaming heart that I did in the middle, that's not an embroidery. That's how I started quilting the quilt. And then um, my happy Saturday friend at a certain point burnt a hole in my quilt accidentally. <laughs> so then in 2015, I mended it. I did some applique and then I quilted over that hole that I filled. And it was amazing even in just two years to see the difference in my thread choice and the way that I made my stitches. And I realized I really liked that. And that maybe there was something beautiful about things not turning out the way I wanted them to. And that that other way things turned out could also be beautiful and interesting. And that's my main lecture that I give when I talk about my history as a quilter is improv life, improv quilts, and the way that improvisational quilting helps me see the beauty in things going with the flow rather than having a set plan, deciding this is what I want, this is how my life will be, and then it doesn't turn out that way and I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, but instead seeing what do I have access to, what opportunities are readily at hand, and then being able to see that as beautiful. So I took this photo of myself with my brand new quilt and then I made some more quilts. This was a baby quilt that I did collaboratively for my friend Sophia. And here's the front and the back of that quilt. All those embroideries are done by people who love her, who were excited at the baby shower. And this it was not a fun last year as a high school art teacher. I was traveling between two different high schools, very, very stressful situation. And this Anais Nin quote was really helpful for me that year. I stuck it on my computer at work and kept thinking that, you know, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And I thought, life feels pretty hard right now. And maybe even though it's scary, I want to change careers or try to do something different. So the third, maybe fourth quilt I ever made was that winter in December. And I thought I want to feel what it's like to be a quilter. So I made this quilt for my dad and I watched like of all the screens to have on there, but I was watching why quilts matter and learning about quilts and the history of quilts. And I was Googling quilters and, you know, discovering people like Maura and Luke and just really getting excited that the idea that a quilter was something that I could be. So this is the quilt I made for my dad. And I love how that one turned out. It was done with natural dye. And here's my uh, 
um, dedication, giving that to him. And then maybe my fifth, seventh quilt is the one that I made when I was transitioning that uh, May, June, from being a teacher to being a full-time quilter just nine months after I made my first hand quilted quilt. So um, it, it was just such a big love affair for me. I really loved everything about making quilts and thought if I could wake up most days and get to work on a quilt, I could be real, real happy. And this was the quilt that I, that was made for me when I was a baby and just kind of that reference point that I had always been around quilts. Uh, I love that this quilt has embroidery and cross stitch and trapunto and applique, both raw edge and turned edge. And I feel like it is very reflective of the way that I work now. Like this recent quilt that has applique on a white background could not be more like this baby quilt that I lived with for a long time. And this is my grandma, the one who's responsible for helping me, um, you know, have access to a quilt like that. This is my mom. Obviously, we had quilts in the house when I was growing up. And my dad, both of my parents instilled a handmade lifestyle for me. So my mom was always sewing clothes for us and cooking and canning and doing things. And my dad and I made this couch that we're sitting on and he made the bed that I had my quilt on earlier in that other photo. And uh, I think I, there's so much that I love about having a handmade lifestyle and getting to make creative things. So this is what I look like now when I wrap myself in a quilt to take a picture. It's usually a little more fancy than the bedroom mirror. And um, this is the quilt pattern that I am doing a quilt along for. And I feel like they connect really powerfully because um, I want to give quilters more access to art vocabulary. And so I went that opposite way. I was really familiar with art. I was an art teacher. I was teaching the elements and principles of art you know, all the time. And I had a lot to learn about what a quilt was. And I think, it's really empowering to share with quilters about art vocabulary. So the quilt pattern that we that I was giving away earlier today and that we're gonna do a quilt along for, uh, this embroidery is one that I made back in like a decade ago, probably 10 years ago. That was a self portrait that I embroidered and that became part of my vignettes quilt. And this is one of the postmodern principles about being obsessive and, I have 10 different strawberry prints that my mom accumulated for covering her jam jars. And I love that I have that many strawberry prints. <laughs> it seems like an obsession to me. Um, some of the other prompts are like value. It's an element of art. And here's my little grayscale uh, representation. Here's a leaf that I traced from the park where I'm doing my artist residency right now. Whoops. <laughs> here's a handkerchief where I'm recontextualizing, I'm making the handkerchief not necessarily a handkerchief anymore, but it's becoming a quilt. And text, having text on a quilt is a really exciting way of using a postmodern principle. I'm on... Um, oh, Aunt Peggy, we can hear you. I'm gonna mute you. <laughs> so um, <laughs> this is my last slide and it's exam an example of what the prompts for the quilt along are going to be. We're going to go for a whole month from full moon to full moon. And so one of the prompts in the quilt pattern is to make a vignette about the element of color. And that day people will post about their color vignette. And then I am encouraging them to use a fancy vocabulary word about color in their post. So use a word that maybe you're not used to using like saturation or a tone or monochromatic. Um, they've got to tag me to credit the quilt pattern. And then the community, the conversation, what, I, what Mara was talking about earlier, that feeling of critique and having peers and having a conversation. So go through the hashtag, find three other people making the quilt pattern and comment and notice the fancy vocabulary word that they used in their post. So you might want to reference like, wow, have you seen hashtag dress like a crayon? Your monochromatic quilt block is so awesome. And I bet you would like that hashtag. Or 
I had to Google the word triadic. I didn't know what that meant. You used it so well once I learned what it was. So that type of interaction and conversation is what I'm really excited for us to engage in with the pattern. And I see that there are a few comments that came in that I didn't notice. Thank you for wishing me a happy quiltiversary. Um, oh, tips on applique for big block letters, trying it out for the first time. Do I try and hide the thread with a slip stitch or do I just own it and highlight the thread with a different stitch? That's up to you. I usually use the ladder stitch rather than the slip stitch when I'm doing applique, but um, I also like to do the running stitch and have it visible like this behind me is with a pale green running stitch on top of a dark green applique fabric. Certainly text is tricky because you've got that reverse applique moment. When you have that sort of an inny corner, I like to do a couple whip stitches and I like to make them real visible and just acknowledge like this part's hard. <laughs> it needs some extra support. And I think that goes back to my like happy Saturday plan. Like sometimes you need some extra support and some extra love. And I sure like got help every which way. I had my friends helping me. I had my therapist helping me. I had like, you know, it took a village chiropractor. Um, so, you know, when you need a little extra support, you should get it. And I think that's a beautiful thing to show by having a whip stitch in a corner like that, for example, inside of a, a letter D. So, oh, that's so sweet. You had my mom's hairstyle. I remember when Mary Fonz got that hairstyle and it just killed me. She looked exactly like my mother. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Oh, that's Zach was saying something. Yeah, that's a real good tip. And, and Heidi, I'm gonna, yeah. because I was just recently watching that video of yours about visible applique, I'm gonna post a link in the chat for people that they might find Beautiful. it interesting. Oh, thank you. Here it comes. <laughs> um, and thank you, Leslie. Yeah, life is messy and it can be real tricky. So you also are asking on your recent commission, did they buy the fabrics? No, all of those fabrics were my fabrics for that recent commission. Um, it's, it's in my gallery page on my website because I put in the time and energy to update that for my quilt anniversary since it was two and a half years out of date. Um, so the quilt she's asking about is But the Wind and that one I provided all of the materials. But we had probably an hour long phone call coming up with what exactly did they want to commission? What was gonna be the appropriate price point I talked about? options that would be in a more economical price point. I talked about things like if we shoot for the moon, what would it look like? How would the quilt be? They went for that option, which is why it's so gorgeous. And it was meant to be inspired by, um, but was that me? Or but what was it like? Sorry, is a different quilt. And as we were having that conversation about how the commission would work, they were sharing that they had lived in Japan for years and that they wanted the quilt to be in a home that they have along Lake Michigan, or not a different lake, but in the state of Michigan, a smaller lake. Uh, and so there were just a lot of really nice things that I was able to reference from my fabric stash. Like I had some fabric that a friend got for me when they were visiting Japan. So I used that special fabric for them to help tell that story. The mom helmet, that's so good, thank you. And I don't know if, if you guys have any live conversation points as well. Um, I will say that just um, that the one quote you shared that you said you made during the transition from teaching to full-time textile. Yeah. This one. Already, that's the same one, right. Yeah. You can like, when I think of your quilts, I see so much of what you do today in that quilt. And yeah. like, you were already on that journey even then. You know? Oh yeah, definitely. And um, it was just so like, what a magic moment for me that I applied to QuiltCon in 2016, like applied in 2015 to be in the 2016 QuiltCon. And this one won first place in handwork. And like, you know, when you don't get into a show or you don't get something, it also like can be so fickle. So you don't have to like be that excited when you win too. But for me in that moment, when I had such a big leap of faith and that was like the quilt 
that I you know, was working. I, it's, it's a black quilt because of the circumstances of my life. I wanted to be able to do a little embroidery or applique when I was like proctoring an exam or doing cafeteria duty, which Zach, I'm sure you know about all too well. And yeah, I feel like I see so much of who, who I am as a quilter right now, both in this quilt and in that baby quilt of mine. Yeah, and thank goodness, Mara, that you started making quilts in 2011. I'm sure someone, else, you know, I would have seen somebody else who was making quilts too. <laughs> You're not like the first people who had the idea to be quilters, but um, for me, it was, it was just so inspiring and exciting to see that there were people who were quilters. And I had um, a copy of Fiber <laughs> Arts Magazine with Luke's quilt on the cover, that American Gothic with the guitar. And I just was like, yes, it can be done. So you had Luke, you came to your, um, you came to your college with Luke, me, and who was the third that you were like? Oh yeah, Luke. it was um, Counterpain, so Pauline Boyd. And she has also been doing a lot of mothering lately. So she hasn't been pushing her business a ton, but my God, like every time she puts out, like maybe every two months, she'll post a photo of one of her quilts and I'm still just staggered by how beautiful they are. And yeah, I went into the alumni support for the Art Institute because they have free alumni support forever. And I came to them and I was like, I want to be a quilter. And they're like, we don't know much about that. Can you explain? And we pulled up your, those three websites and uh, like just the way that they looked at your websites was incredible. They're like, look at the resume. If you scroll down to the bottom, <laughs> those are some things you could do right now that could be helpful to launch your career. And look at the way people are advertising things differently. Like Pauline Boyd, especially at the time, her website, she wanted to be in your home. It was a beautiful photo of a house and the quilts were like stacked on a chair. And then we looked at Luke's website and everything was edited and flat. It's like, he wants you to think maybe they could be paintings, like to not necessarily identify it right away as um, that like warm, fuzzy quilt. And just seeing, seeing those three websites through the eyes of my advisor was like a light bulb went on. I thought, okay, I think I can figure out who I am as a quilter then. And uh, it was just, it was an amazing, amazing time for me that year of 2014 till 15 when I was getting a lot of help and living in Chicago and then I felt like I um, was ready to rock in 20 that summer 2015 when I moved to Milwaukee all right and then onward I think to Luke so uh I figured what I would do because we had the amazing VIP plus one Mora here today. I wanted to, uh, I actually, either, <laughs> this is either fun or like <clears throat> the worst idea when you have the master showing a project you did that was sort of, you know, in their vein. So I wanted to show some of those indigo projects that I did. Um, Not I, I don't call myself a master, but. <laughs> well, we, you, you don't have to, so we will. Okay. Um, all right, why is it not pulling up? Hold on a second, y'all. Share screen, there we go, okay. Um, so uh, I, I dabbled in indigo once. <laughs> um, and as we talked about kind of at the, the top end, um, it is not my preference to do anything small. Um, so I figured if I was gonna go to the trouble of making a big smelly vat, and learn how to turn fabric to a different color. I might as well make a 50 gallon uh, drum of it so that I could um, really try it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and for those of you guys who, who haven't ever tried indigo, it is a fascinating experience of these like plant bits that turn it bright green. And then as it oxidizes, it turns this beautiful blue and uh, you know, you dump it a couple times and it sort of gets richer. And there's this like, you know, this alchemy to it, right? You kind of like, what have I done? What, what magic is this? Uh, and so um, I uh, took over a, <laughs> a yard of, of my partner at the time and um, 
as I said earlier, I dyed 300 yards of, of fabric, all, all uh, sheets. So all from the Goodwill I've been collecting for however long. Uh, so, and for me, I use primarily reclaimed closing reclaimed textiles as the base fabric so that there's already some kind of story and some um, kind of texture to it that uh, really gets, Get, get you going. So when you come up to one of my quilts, there's uh, really often kind of a nostalgia to understanding where that pattern is, especially if you're going with sheets, because everyone has that era where there's this nostalgia for the sheets that either your grandma had or you had growing up or whatever. So um, I come across a lot of those. But anyway, for this Indigo project, um, what I did was I made this huge vat and then I dyed all of the fabric in the same vat. So as the vat became uh, less saturated with dye, I actually created a gradient through just the process of dyeing. So um, the first dips were darker than the last dips because there was just less dye in the vat. And so as a result of that, I had this gradient of fabric that I was able to work with um, and create all of these different patterns. Uh, and you can kind of see some of the the, the 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 systems that I could use to break down these fabrics. So in this one, there's probably, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many different fabrics, <clears throat> 60 different fabrics that were all dyed and then cut apart and then recombined into their gradient um, and then kind of sewn back together. <clears throat> so it created this really nice uh, transition of tone. Uh, the reason I made it, the 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 kind of, excuse to try indigo was this project with Seattle Art Museum um, where they ask artists to create table settings and um, sell spots at these table settings as their big fundraiser uh, and so for me I made the all of this indigo and covered the entire area in this blue for the Seattle Art Museum um, which was really really fun but uh, I also had a, a, a whole lot of leftover um, fabric. But one of the other cool things that, that I just kind of wanted to show was some of the projects that came out of it. Because while you have a big vat of indigo, uh, you might as well stick things that you've been hoarding into it and see what happens. And so because uh, the fabric that I primarily use is reclaimed, there is myriad material types. So in this one, you can see Gosh, I don't have a picture of the original, but you can see it was just uh, reds, maroons, and whites. And but the difference, and so here you can see where the natural fibers took the dye and the very unnatural fibers really did not take the dye. So there's this really kind of cool tonal shift that happened by dumping it in this big old vat of indigo. Um, here's another project with some assistance, very helpful. And you can see there the same thing happened where some of the natural the natural fibers took the dye really well, and then some of the uh, unnatural fibers fully resisted it. So we get these kind of little bits uh, left over. And um, what was really fun about that one is I did a collaboration with Joe Cunningham on that on that quilt top. Um, which is, which is fun. We're having a show coming up on the 25th in San Francisco at his studio, which would be really great. It's going to be all of our collaborations over the past oh, five or six years. So I think we have 10, 10 collaborations that we get to show, which would be so, so, so fun. Um, but you can kind of see here how the indigo kind of interacted with all of those different fabric types and how I could, and this one, the, the gradient actually happened with the quilting. I don't have a detail, but I used light thread up through darker thread. So that kind of color tone change to the sky is all the very heavy quilting that was horizontal. So it's all actually pretty flat in terms of the blue, but I used a lot of thread to kind of give it a sky for the, the flying geese to make it out. Uh, another quilt made from those indigos. And again, I, I was saying earlier, I still have some of this fabric and I think I did it five years ago because 300 yards is a lot to go through. Uh, I did a lot of blue things for a while and then had to go, <laughs> had to go stare at other colors. Um, but this is a double wedding ring. Um, 
where the gradient is made, as I said, the color tone change happened through using the same dye vat. So the dye became less saturated over time. And so uh, what I did after dyeing all of that fabric and washing it and making a huge mess of a public laundromat and getting kicked out and everything, um, I re set it in terms of its its uh, color gradient, which which didn't actually happen exactly one to one with the vat because some of the the material, some of it was fifty percent polyester, so it didn't take the dye as well. So I created the gradient after all of it was done, and then cut that apart, and then created this um, double wedding ring out of all of those uh, gradients. So there's probably you know again sixty eighty different fabrics that have been dyed that come together to make it look like it's just a, a kind of simple gradient, but actually the simplicity of that is, <laughs> it's not simple. Um, it was a real pain in, in the patoot, but it was pretty fun to kind of figure out the, the, the math and everything. Um, this is a, another indigo that I took on a trip to Jamaica. Um, one of my big soap boxes as a maker is that quilts are sculpture. Quilts hold space, quilts live in environment. We all, and the thing that I learned more and you know, Heidi's really correct. When I first started my, my kind of presentation of quilts was very, um, treat this as art. I still believe the quilts are art, but I'm not trying to shove that into the world anymore. I think people are starting to kind of believe that so we can have deeper conversations about it, which I'm so excited about. So now I get to talk about quilts as sculpture because I think quilts, um, and that's where kind of our soft bolt came from, right? Quilts as existing with sculpture uh, in space, they hold space. So throwing it in the ocean, uh, kind of letting that blue talk to the blue was, was a really fun way to have the uh, generative conversation about sculptural objects. Um, and then this project I did last year where I made um, an indigo quilt. And then I, so I, this quilt in the background, there's a traditional quilt that I bought from an estate sale. And then this background here is an indigo quilt that I made to the exact same size as that other one. And then I cut this shape out of both and then switch them. So this one has the indigo wiggle in the middle and this one has that traditional wiggle in the middle. So it's this great kind of uh, then versus now, kind of modern versus, uh, you know, um, traditional, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just this really great um, <clears throat> conversation between my work and the history of that work, but also just this, this gesture, right? It's just so uh, simple. It seems so kind of like, um, non-complex, and, and that was very intentional, and the idea that, you know, quilts take forever. We all know they take forever, you know, especially these ones with all these little pieces and all these points, and they match so beautifully, so to just throw a squiggle on top of it that just seems so non-intentional um, non uh, was kind of playing to that kind of pop art ethos where it seems very throwaway and simple and you know I can you're seeing a picture of this a small thumbnail and it still looks as dynamic as it does in person that idea that scaling uh, because of the way that we um, imbibe art really has to do with um, simplicity of access and the thing I love about quilts is that there is still more to find whereas a lot of kind of contemporary pop art simple work uh, doesn't have a lot to discover when you get up close so I think quilts are a beautiful way to interject a conversation that says maybe it's cool from afar but it's also cool up close you know let's talk about it come stick your face on it and tell me you think my binding sucks or whatever <laughs> and let's talk about it and i'm fully all for that um, Look, katie just yeah. asked a question that makes me like um she's asking about flipping it but i think the answer is that it's two separate quilts right you these are two quilts stacked both quilts on top of each other and then you just flip flopped and so it's fronts these yeah, are the two separate. fronts i didn't add the backs um but yeah the, the backs are also awesome but i figured yeah. if we're for, for timing wise today, um, I just put just the front, but you can see uh, if I flip between the shape is the same. So if it was the back, it would be the opposite. So it's actually two different quilts that I usually hang side by side. So you can kind of see one folding into the other one. Um, 
and then I have one more little project to show. Luke, and then hold on just, just a second, if you don't mind, because I got the same question a couple other people do. So how do you secure that cutout piece into the hole that you pop it into? Oh man, I want you want to tell all my secrets over the internet, Zach? Listen to this guy. Listen I think that this. sounds like a Luke University class. Yeah, you know what? I want to teach. A, <laughs> you know what? I do want to teach a class because I think it's so uh, interesting and um, just a, a way to also because it is a piece of another quilt, right? That's the thing that I love about quilts is we're not we're not coloring on it. We're not taking a canvas and then. Uh, using skills of drawing, creating an environment. We are taking an object and putting it together with other objects. And now we have a bigger object that's more interesting, you know? And I think that's such a beautiful part about quilting. Um, and in this case, very specifically taking a part of a, in this case, finished object and combining it with another one. Um, All right, yeah. I just want to interject as well that, um... Our collaboration with me and Joe Cunningham and Stephanie, this is what I'm dreaming that you will do to those <laughs> holes that I cut in there. And then maybe that quilt can be in your show too, because it's- That's the hope. If I, can, if I can get it done before we leave on Tuesday, it's coming with me. That's oh, it'd be so amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're gonna have to throw a party for that. Oh, I know. I just looked at the post date on it. It said 2018. So that was the last time it got shipped in the mail. So I haven't touched it for three years. Um, but um, anyway, so it just, yeah, just to kind of beautiful. Yeah, and thank you, thank you. But just this kind of idea of kind of some of the things that have come out of some of those indigo projects. And here's something I made uh, two months ago uh, using more of that indigo that I still just have in these big bins. Um, there's less now, thankfully, but um, or not thankfully, I guess it's beautiful. And so I just put a, a portrait on top of that. And this one's going to go to an artist in. Um, oh, somewhere in the Northwest who, who puts fabric into the wilderness and then photographs it over decades as it decomposes. So um, I use some um, neon uh, edging and then I put in some reflective piping and reflective thread so that as you photograph it, it kind of shines and, and all of that. But more just wanted to kind of talk about some of those indigo, those indigo things that I had done. That's stop share uh well anyway i did look I, did, I wasn't watching the chat i don't know if any questions have come up i can um uh go through and, and look at those question wise i know we're, we're coming to it and i really well, want to idea that class that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> um Let's see. So a uh, question right at the bottom, does, are there signatures? So everyone has different ways of doing signatures. Heidi showed some of hers. Hers are beautifully hand embroidered and you can kind of see her name. Um, uh, Zach probably does something similar. I have a die cut that I actually cut my logo out and then put it on top of uh, the quilt. I'll look at Maura down there with her awesome <laughs> folk fibers um, label logo. Uh, and so everyone does their own. I think it's really important to sign your work. Um, I sign my work on the front and um, <laughs> it's kind of a painter does. And I remember early on in my kind of quilt career when I left my garage, uh, I got both accolades and flack for that. You know, oh, don't sign it on the front. Who do you think you are? Versus also, I never thought about signing it on the front and pretending like I'm a real artist. So it really comes down to kind of intentionality, I think. Um, as to where you put it, but absolutely put your name on it as big as you want, because it's so important to uh, tell everyone that you made it and, and what you can do with it and, and kind of how that, how that comes in over time. Look at her, look at that stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Was that for a die resist? It's, um yeah, for block printing. Um, someone, a friend got it made for me in India. I. I don't use it really often. I, it's more of a display piece. <laughs> well, it's awesome. Um, da, 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 da. Am I missing a bunch of, I, I guess, um, oh, those are your questions about the, uh, the, the, look, I'm just gonna, I'll teach a class on how to make things and put two quilts together and it'll be easy. They're super affordable and we can answer all those questions. So um, I, will, I will defer those questions um to 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 my class luke university join <laughs> um, that, Maura, i would love to hear hear you i have a million questions so i better let you start 
Oh, um, that, that was awesome, Luke. I'll, I, I, I'm, okay. This is amazing being here, watching you guys present, listening, hearing, soaking it in. It brings back like kind of this old part of myself that is a workaholic, <laughs> that <laughs> be so prolific as an artist. It took me so long to find myself that once I did, I didn't want to stop. And I had so much adrenaline and I still do. Um, but I also knew deep inside, I wanted to be a mother. So there's this sacrifice I'm working with right now. And it's a, the biggest paradox in life I've ever lived in. And it's actually a lot of fuel for creativity without a lot of time. So there's something happening and brewing and stirring. I sort of feel like all the weather is inside of me, like the storms and the sunshine and the everything. Um, and I, I, I mean, truthfully, I could definitely not get bored and like stay shut into my studio for like, it's funny, a mom asks for like a week or in your life, oh my God, it's a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, where I miss the nine to five, I do, but I, I will not miss my children's baby years because I can't get them back. So I have this long-term view of being an artist right now and it's a dance. And I tried at first with my first one, it got so hard to not be able to connect with my artist self and make and produce that I thought, well, I need to stop doing art because it's making motherhood harder. And let me just shelve it. Like, let me just quit really is what I felt. And I try, I tried that and it sucked. Um, I turned into kind of a monster mom and like was like not happy and not feeling like fully myself and alive and like coming to the table with like enough to give. So it was a huge learning curve and value that I understood because I was an artist before a mother and I started my business as an entrepreneur before becoming a mother. There's this interesting like big feeling of life before launching motherhood that I wanted to kind of go back to, you know, I'm like, that was great. That was easy to control. That was fulfilling. That was like getting up nine to five. That's not hard to like do something nine to five is like luxurious. Mm -hmm. Like it's, um, it's, it's one foot in front of the other is all it is. And it's one, you know, one piece of fabric to another. It's just like building blocks. And that's, um, that's a really, that's flow that feels like flow like a river um so when i found out the value of making art though wasn't about like prolificness or coming up with ideas being brilliant um challenging myself and making meeting those challenges and going forward and forward there was like i learned it wasn't about the outward acceptance and gaining self-confidence or accolades from the outside world, but like how it had to come inside. And so there's this, it's now art as therapy. And yeah, I do really enjoy when my kids are old enough to send them to school because I get my studio time back. Um, and there's this happy dance that happens with that. And it's like a glorious achievement. But when, when what's funny is, you get there as a mom and just a few hours into your work day, you're like, where are those cuties? Where are they? They're always being so original more than I am. I'm older. My brain's rigid. Like they're so, they are my inspiration. So it's like an interesting tension between the motherhood and the artist. Um, and I've taught many workshops. I also really love teaching and I've taught many of them at my house, thanks to my husband to basically encourage me, push me to just like let down my guard and not, not worry about whatever brand it looks like or whatever, like, you know, we live in a 1980s house that needs updates. And um, 
we don't have like the ton of money to like make it a showpiece. Um, but little by little we're improving it. And I started workshops from like the first few months when we moved in here eight years ago. And that experience of teaching was bomb to my soul because you know, people who are in this quilting community are all ages, all different backgrounds and in that the people that come give you like this knowledge, this wisdom from like different seasons of life. And like a lot of women came kind of telling me like, look, it goes by fast, you hear it, but it really does. And like, I'm sitting here empty nested and coming into my art practice just now. And I wish I would have stayed in my art practice or found this before I became an empty nester. So there's this passage passing of wisdom and knowledge between the workshops. Um, and I've never forgotten like some of those lessons learned um, and just keeping that balance. Um, I think that answers like Larissa um, in, on Instagram, I asked what would people like to hear me talk about? And there was a, a great amount of questions and she, her, her question really was about mothering children while mothering your creativity. And basically she's like, lots of my energy is spent on babies. And it's like such a true fact, but I don't think the answer is, um, it's not easy. It's like everyone, so for instance, my baby's nine months old and I had a hard day on Thursday and I called the daycare down the road. And I thought, well, what's the, do you guys have any openings? I could use like two days a week to like, just have some like time that even though I don't want to miss him, he's my dumpling. I just need to like balance what I'm feeling inside of me is like frustration. And I don't want to bring that to the table with him. And, you know, they're like, well, we have a year wait list. So, and I'm like, okay, good. Cause I'm not ready. But like, and when <laughs> <laughs> because I really do want that. And I'm feeling just the having them on the line and knowing it's coming is just like enough of a relief to like build that support system to just not worry too much about it because time is a funny thing. It's just like super slow and super fast at the same time. And, and um, I don't want to spend too much on that because it is so unique for everyone. And um. I feel what I have going on is unique for myself and it feels like a lot. And it's probably, um, like I said, because I had a lot going on before becoming a mom. So I have a lot to return to in, um, and to reinvent really. Um, I thought a fun thing would be what's in my lap is my first baby quilt for my baby. Um, I come from this thought that it's very hard to, I didn't know. And it felt like a little bit of pressure being a quilter and having to make a baby quilt for your own baby. <laughs> like some, I, I had a few like iterations, you know, there was the Lone Star I started with. It was like pinks and yellows and I turned it into a, a bag and you, you know, it was one of those, like I made the star and didn't finish because it felt too, like I was stamping her identity or her like color. And I didn't know who she was yet. I didn't know if she was gonna be a pink girl. I didn't know. And I I was so, so what I landed on was all white. And, um, and I used um, the softest like white that I could. And I wish I would have done a, I'm learning and I'm gonna do a slideshow next time I have this opportunity because I love how that screen sharing looks. Um, but this is cotty cotton. And what's so special about it is it's not just any kind of cotton. It's a cotton from India that is a movement. You know, Gandhi's cotty cotton is taking back the independence of India from Britain and to take the cotton scraps left over from the fields that the Brit, the Britain like had forced them to grow and then took and then produced for themselves. And Gandhi basically was like, we could do things with these little scraps of cotton. If you just go out in the fields after they pick them, we can do these. We have, they created like this mass 
like distribution of hand, like hand um, spinning devices in the homes and everyone would take their little cottons that were around their villages and like spin and spin and then they would weave into cotton. And that's the word kati came from that movement. It's more than a fabric. And so that I felt like it wasn't about the design, the pattern, the color. To me, it was more about the cloth that created the baby quilt. And it's um, all natural batting and hand, cotton um, Sasha Co stitching and hand stitching. And then the binding is a sweet little color. It's just um, before I had my child, before I even got pregnant, I was harvesting and I dyed this color um, with, the pine cones from the bald cypress tree, which is just a really light pale pink. Um, and they usually grow near the water in um, Texas. So I think that just like shows how thoughtful I feel as a quilter when it comes to making things, especially for my own daughter. And she loves this quilt. You know, she doesn't like think it's boring because it's white. It's um, it really goes to show like they appreciate anything handmade from their mother. It's like that holding that is reminding them of their mother's touch. And and segueing really, what she turned into is a silk snob because she also got tons of silk blankies, and um, because silk dyes so brilliantly bold, I wanted. Children love that vibrant, saturated color and cotton and linen, any cellulose fabric doesn't dye as brilliant as silk. I'll just hold up some like silk colors that are dyed, you know, it's just so, it's like, it's better. I mean, it's better than commercial dye. It's just like brilliantly dark. Um, so I was making her silk blankets with this really nice, thick, high-end silk charmeuse and it's my favorite silk because it's like blanket weight. And I like suede silk charmeuse because it's less shiny and it's more like suede. And so I would dye those and then basically envelope fold them and just double, double them up. And um, what's beautiful is I'm now, she's seven years old and she still sleeps with her silky and it's thread born. It's like a nest. And I'm thinking I'll have to like, frame it like a, it, when she feels ready, um, whatever shreds is left like a shadow box, I feel like. And I did this one woman I follow, Glennon Doyle um, was talking about her silk blanket that she shared with her sister and her dad did frame their silky when they went to college and he wrote on the little piece of glass, break in an emergency and it's just like sweet that like sentiment of like it's a shadow box that can be broken it doesn't need to be like you know so there's that that's kind of like a big part of my heart and where I come from as a mother and how it segues into being a quilter but then I thought let's lighten it up a little and like and talk about like what's this this big thing that's in the quilt world is those like UFO projects, the unfinished projects. Well, I didn't really know about them until I like became a mom because I was crazy. I'm a crazy worker. I love working. And, um, and now where I don't like have that structure and um, discipline in my work life, I have UFOs. <laughs> They're super fun, um, but I, I'm, um, I'm gonna get them done. At least this one that's sitting behind me, I'm gonna pick it up. It's, it's my, um, the quilt that I'm saying, I need to get back to the studio because Beautiful. I need to complete this quilt, which is, um, all my work is naturally dyed. And this is like my most brightest, fabric. So the, the concept behind this quilt for me and why I'm working on it and why I even started it was that my life feels like a kaleidoscope. It's super beautiful and mesmerizing, but a little bit jumbled up and every little turn and twist feels like it's like moving me and I don't always want it to. Um, 
but there's no stop in it. It's like a toy, right? And, um, and that's also there. I have a tendency, like in therapy, I've had this aha moment when the therapist was like, yes, this is all true. You can also choose, you can choose to just see the beauty and lighten up about it and make some jokes. Like it's also humorous. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this is what I needed. This is the yin to my yang. I need humor, I need comedy. I love like, I mean, I'm, I'm like, that's what I choose to indulge in is like comedy when I have free time and um, I don't have to like, I can pick whatever I watch on TV, it's comedy. Um, so the this quilt, I'm calling it the kaleidoscope quilt. And I was inspired. I, this is another question I got from the audience that where do you get your inspiration for your quilts? And I, I think to me, the best answer is like walking around in life, walking, being alive, just looking, keeping my eyes open, staying curious. Um, one of the things that moves me the most is light, lighting, um, outdoors, the sky. Um, so that mood, very moody, like I, if I were to be a painter, the painting genre I would go into is impressionist painting. I love that capturing that same hill like five different times because it's five different lights in the you know in one hour even it's just one it's I love I love impressionist paintings um so that is one of the things that really gets me stirred up about being an artist and light and color and that's what I love so much about natural dyes is it's never the same it's always variables and it's always changing and evolving um, but this kaleidoscope quilt also, it comes down to, I think a very relatable place to be inspired is sometimes it's other quilts and in vintage quilts or antique quilts or that traditional, like it's already been done before, but I'm dyeing my own fabrics and using different colors. And I am creating this quilt that is very much like the one that inspired me. And I, I was um, talking to Heidi about this because it was the first time I was at QuiltCon, I think that was 2012. It was the first QuiltCon ever. Um, and it was, what was it, Robert? Um, it was a vintage quilt that was being shown on a sideshow. Denise Schmidt was the keynote. She was showing her works quilts and yeah, a Robert lot of Kerkhoff. Yeah, Robert Kerkhoff. Oh, wait, he... what's that? Is that the right person? Zach, you know. Roderick, yeah. Roderick, yes. Roderick. <laughs> which which I, I'm sure Zach could probably say even more. Uh, I hear he's coming out with a new book and there's things happening. <laughs> um, so his collection was on the sidelines. And it was probably my favorite thing in the show. And there was this just like hexagonal quilt. And I took a picture with my iPhone. And what was that like almost 10 years ago? And I had these bright, bright, bright colors that's like in my bag of scraps. And I wanted to cut them up in strips and work with strips. And I just sort of like workshopped it in a simple form. And that's another thing. I look at your work, Luke, and all of y'all's work. And I'm like, it's, it's so interesting how what we choose to work on delights ourselves. And I also could not do what you do. <laughs> I couldn't like make what you're making because what I'm choosing to work on is something that is delicious to me. Like I, that looks good. That looks enjoyable. I want to do that and I skip over many ideas like that double wedding ring as traditional and classic as it is it doesn't doesn't look fun to me that doesn't that does not sound and look fun maybe maybe someday I don't know I'm not looking for that challenge right now that I really like feeling like I want some easy feelings but I also like I will every quilt I make I feel like I challenge myself in a new level in a new way we all do that um so the block that I workshopped was really pretty quite simple, 
And my trick is what I what I teach in my um, I made I made a quilt video workshop um, from start to end on how to make a quilt with my husband and my best friends, Josh Goldman and Murphy Monday Paul. They video they I, they helped with video production and editing and publishing it and it's my one it's my one passive income <laughs> and it's it's awesome I mean and I one of the things I had to pick is something that's really approachable for someone who's never quilted before and I felt like foundation piecing is because it's sort of like a trick um and here's this quilt hat like I basically I broke it up and like you can see that I just made this block into four triangles and I'm just sewing. Oh, oh no, here I am. Oh, good. <laughs> sewing on top of the block, which creates this and it starts to look really involved when you just start putting them all together. So I feel like that also is like what my vibe is, is like, I love simplicity, but I also love like, intricacy and like where that meets so like, um, like you just do one thing each hour <laughs> yeah so I time myself and that, day. yeah that block takes about 45 minutes to an hour depending on how focused I can be um and I like to, I like to get a goal for myself like if I make one a day and I have 18 blocks left to create this you know size then I can do it I just always break it down like that um and, and having a new studio is like the ticket for me because I didn't really have a place set up that I could keep a table of my own and no one else put their stuff on it. Like that seems to be a serious thing when you have kids. It's just like, they just take over your table and you're, you're kind of like always, I cater to them, you know, really truly. So it's like, I put my stuff away and let them do their thing. And so it, having this space is, uh, is good. Um, it's like for me to kind of return to myself and take myself more seriously. Um, so, and Luke, I, anyone, I'm curious, I, I love hearing questions from other people because I don't want to just talk. I mean, there's a lot of great questions that I got. People are asking about cooking. I'm like, I love it. I, I baked, I baked sourdough bread. I was baking sourdough bread before the pandemic. And to me, that's how I go fancy. I bake fresh bread and then vegetables and meat. My husband loves to grill and smoke meat and we kind of pair things together. We throw things together truly and honestly. Um, but we feel fancy when we make things from scratch. Um, we, we're in a funny season. Um, so I just have to call, I have to text my um, husband real quick for a charger. <laughs> I, gotta I can come over. So. This, this is a good segue. Um, we're in the other side of my studio. Is it, I'm gonna plug in, but I don't have an extension cord. So you're just gonna see me. Oh, that's um, so cool. Yeah, and we are, you know, we're trying out this new format of present and then Q&A immediately after. And so it's a different way of uh, keeping track of the time and, and figuring out how to transition. But the the shifting of your le your camera could be a perfect moment <laughs> to um, shift a little from presenting to conversation. And uh, Okay, that's a little bit of the view. So well, what we do is... We just took a garage and we renovated a garage. It's a two car garage. Um, the real fancy thing is the uh, 16 foot door. Um, wow. That is the north side. So we get really good light. And, um, you know, I mean, that's what it's all about to me is the lighting. Um, so it's it's still, oh, so it's still halfway in renovation form because um, this room became such a good workshop that we're using it to like, stage um some new trim and then bedrooms <laughs> like boring stuff that it's like super important too um i'm gonna go back to this way because then sorry guys i'm making you dizzy um but okay thanks so okay now any questions <laughs> Congratulations on your studio space. That's going to make such a, uh, I, I, you know, so as a person who's had a lot of studios and moved a lot, um, 
designated workspace makes such a difference in your mind, right? Like, like your productivity may or may not be vastly different depending on your personality type, but by gosh, having a designated environment just cleans your mind out. I know. Thank you, Luke. I love hearing that because I feel that. And I'm like, yeah, it's happening. Um, investing in myself and, um, and nurturing that need um, I have, which is going to become, I'm a better mom, a better friend, a better sister, a better wife, you know, all of it happens from kind of starting at where my needs are. So. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just true. Yeah. These are big goals here. I'm just trying to get away from the canned beans. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Soon enough, Zach, come on down to the Southeast and you'll be just, you know, having the palatial. I, I'm getting there. You know, I'm getting there. What's up? That time? I'm all about this window too. That's why I sew in my living room instead of in the second bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really take a, I didn't really keep up with chats during that, um, or texts, um, comments, but if y'all saw anything, I can check too, or if you have any, I'm so curious what questions you would have for me. What yeah. And if you have questions for, for us as well, you know, just. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was a question. I know. I think um, you had a couple questions you were eager to ask Luke about. Okay, Luke, I have a fun question for you. Well, I'm ready. <laughs> um, years ago, I was looking on your website, and years ago, I don't know, five, and you had a really interesting tab on there that said trades um, for work. And you had like really big ideas for what you could trade your work for. Like, I don't remember, but it felt like you were asking like boats or vacations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious if any of that has come to fruition like you know that... actually interestingly enough uh you know i i truly miss that tab and that's one of those things that uh you know like heidi was saying she she's updated her her daily work two years later or whatever uh you know i maybe i should go back write myself a note to put it back on there because i just i love i it generated a lot of conversations because as a maker and you probably get this a lot um not just everyone, right? Just this idea that not everyone can afford to buy the objects with money. It's just the nature of the, it's, they're expensive. They have to be expensive because of the time and everything. Uh, but what I liked about the trade page was it put into people's minds that they have resources that I might want uh, that they might be able to give me. Uh, so I absolutely, I got a trip around Europe for <laughs> Change, which was wonderful. Someone had enough uh, airline miles and friends in Europe that I could stay with in exchange for uh, doing a, a long teaching session. So um, that was wonderful. They maybe didn't have the cash to send me, but like as far as airline, you know, that worked out great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because I think that that reminding people that we all have a lot of resources um, outside of fiscal, uh, and that's why I like to do a lot of collaborations, and I do a lot of art trades. Um, you know, with most of my my art collection is trades with other artists um, because maybe I don't have the cash either. You know, even though that's sort of the price point on mine, that doesn't mean I can turn around and spend it either. So, uh, you know, yeah. trades is such a good way to remind us kind of that we we ultimately live in a, a world of barter. We just pretend the money is just the, the sort of pretend for the barter, right? You, you, it's just a holding place. Um, but uh, I mean, my trade page was was out of the world. I mean, it was, you know, cars and boats and fancy sunglasses and stuff, just just as as a joke in some way, but also uh, as a way to just sort of remind. And it really went well and it really generated a lot of conversation. So I'm glad you saw that and reminded me. It was so it was such a fun way to start conversations with people who um, I mean, because the, the thing for me is that anyone who goes out of their way hard enough to try to find how to get my work that maybe can't afford it. I want to get them that I want them that, you know, like we're going to work it out. We're going to sort it out one way or the other. So someone who goes through that page and is like, well, maybe I don't have an extra, you know, house in the California Hills, but I do have whatever. Um, it was, yeah, it was just, it was a fun way to start a conversation with, with 
people and their resources and what they were excited about and what they could maybe share and all that. I love it. I'm um, just getting back to work is also making me look at my website that probably hasn't been touched in seven years. I don't know. And I'm working with my friend Mason in um, Austin. And one of the things I have to actually do, I've never done as my humble brag. I don't know if it's a good idea or not, not very business savvy, but I never put my press in one place or even like put it always. It's such a new thing for me to put the cover of Magnolia magazine on my Instagram grid made me cringe and made me be like, just do it. Like it's not a big deal. And I would have never done that in the past because I felt like not how I approach someone in the courtyard of a building is like, I, I'm in this, I just never, even at a dinner party, I could go all dinner. I'm not going to tell them what I'm featured in. It just doesn't feel like who I am. Um, I'm proud of it and I keep it all really nice and like organized on my shelf and I've archived it, but I'm going to start putting it on my website because one of the coolest things is someone said, I just started following you and I'm curious about hearing more interviews of your process and your work, where could I find them? And I thought, well, that's brilliant. I need a tab on my website because that would be great to just put someone in touch with like where they could hear more about me telling my story and explaining my process instead of like keeping it, you know, in the hands of Google. So like, I feel ready, um, but I think I might put a trade tab on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I love it. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's uh, there. I mean, that's just a, a deep conversation uh, in terms of like talking about press and um, accolades and stuff is such a hard conversation, right? Because like you don't want because your friends who are on say on Instagram, right? Your friends who are there, like you want to talk about your life and your experience, and like if you're in a thing, great. If you're not, great. But the other side of it is you have to be as impressive as possible so that, you know, money comes in and whatever your sort of fiscal situation is. So it's really a difficult line to, uh, I can understand. And I would be curious about how you've navigated because you said you've been teaching out of your house for a while. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've only just started this year. And I feel so uh, kind of like what you're saying. I feel so different when I'm asking people to like buy things from me and, you know, support me fiscal and take my classes you know that cost money whereas up until this year it's only just been let me tell you everything and just show you pictures so how have you navigated with um <clears throat> stuff like that right as you like ask for people to take your class and and uh, you know i don't know all of your business strategies i mean do you sell objects and <laughs> teach classes and <laughs> but, um, so the only passive income I have going for me is the workshop that I produce, the video workshop I produce called Guidebooks, Folk Fibers Guidebooks. And my husband has been my back end logistics guy. He's a developer and he and I we don't work together anymore. We decided once we had kids, that's that's enough. We need to draw the boundary. <laughs> so I had to replace him and he's so irreplaceable. I haven't really <laughs> I'm like just now getting around to replacing him seven years later. I'm like, I know my, my good buddy Mason can do it. I just took me a while. And I'll say this is I get encouraged and pushed to, to print, like tell people about what I'm doing. And every time I do say something, I'd make a sale on it, but I don't do it enough. And I'm realizing I could hire a help like a studio assistant because I have this whole like bag of beautiful stories. The way I would want to tell guidebooks is people email me and show me their finished work and tell me the sweetest stories about, I, I worked on this quilt, my very first quilt ever as a gift to my daughter. And I would work on it in secret when she wasn't home. And then I finally presented it to her and now it's on her bed and she, and I'm going to cry thinking about like that, that step someone took in their life to do something for themselves. And those stories are how I would present, like to tell people and spread the word. It's very much easier to tell the story that's heartfelt than to tell like the press. So I, I'm a really deep thinker and that's kind of how I would like approach talking about press. Asking people to buy things doesn't feel comfortable. When I'm at the workshops in person, I don't usually like pitch sales. Um, I've been at ones that have, and it feels normal. It feels good. Um, 
my husband or someone assisting me, I've, ha- I've hired assistants, like friends to help me, um, you know, get coffee and tea to people and, and serve lunches. And like, I'll hire a friend in and they help me kind of cover my bases. Sometimes like telling people where they can source or buy things. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I think my answer. You are amazing at selling quilts. You know, you, you, <laughs> shared recently you have only one quilt available for sale. And that's the quilt we used in our advertising graphic. Like okay. I have a lot more than one quilt available to buy. And okay. it's amazing. Let's get, candy. That. Let's get candy for a second. <laughs> I, it's hard to sell expensive quilts when they're over the 7,000 range it's a specific client, a specific sale, and it sits for a long time, sometimes most of the time. If it's in the $4,000 range, they sell out, you know, by Christmas because everyone's looking for a special gift that's in that price bracket for their daughter's 40th birthday or um, something like their wife has everything she ever needed and a quilt that's him. So there's specific clients that come, but it's a really hard because I was talking and thinking last night, Heidi, yeah. what you said means so much. The quilt is more valuable than the money sometimes that you can get for it. Mm-hmm. And I've definitely sold price things low enough to sell because I'm investing in building my studio. I'm investing in getting back to work and I need to keep that ball rolling forward. I envy the artist that doesn't have to sell a thing and just makes to be art and not business. So the, the two connection there, it's got my brain thinking I might need to like have a hobby of a painter just to make some things that aren't for sale. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's, I mean, I'm coming, I'm telling you guys, I'm coming into a new place that is reinventing myself. And the reason I do what I do isn't so much business forward as much. Mm-hmm. I love selling quilts though. Seriously, I would love to ask, like, it's the trashiest question, but like, how much is the most expensive quilt you've sold? And I hate that that like even is a question in my mind, but at the same time, like, but that's also useful because what we could all do as a movement as quilters and Heidi, you did this conversation at QuiltCon with someone else about really no quilt should be under $10,000. Something about- Tara, Tara yeah, Fox, she- I think said that at the- um so society podcast yes and I was like that makes sense to me if you really calculate this the hourly rate you know 250 hours going into a quilt that's hand quilted and all this other stuff or just the art behind it the concept that's all but then okay you sell a quilt ten thousand dollars you sell a painting that's that same equivalent for twenty thousand that's what's frustrating to me about the medium of quilts and I like that this is a conversation, this softball community, I think is like a way to push that dial where art quilts as art is so serious um, that if you compare it just to paintings, cause that's helpful for people, that's something they understand. It's, um, it is 10,000 is cheap. Oh yeah, for for painting, for other art things. And I think that hints as well at a question that Katie Armstrong asked about um, the formula for pricing a quilt. Yes. And one of the things that I feel like I notice repeatedly is people get asked what they charge and they're only worth what most quilters are willing to charge for their quilts. And you know that that question that we talked about in the very very first soft bulk uh, that you hint, asked me about earlier, Mara, is the the idea that like things like quilts and mending and things that women have traditionally made at home for free, how do you transition from free to a price is such a tricky thing. And then you go on Etsy and you see like what does a quilt cost and it's three dollars an hour if even for a lot of them and that you know like if people are looking at quilts for sale and those are the kinds of prices they're seeing and then someone comes along and says I want four thousand dollars for my quilt that's confusing to people and so I think you know, sharing about models for pricing and 
uh, explaining why things are priced. Like in our live yesterday, we were talking about like, what does a massage therapist charge? What does a plumber charge? What do other industries charge for hourly rates for things? And how does the time and talent and experience required compare between those different fields and industries that, um, you know, it's tricky. I feel like that is its own soft bulk conversation, especially as we're near and on two hours of talking to each other. Uh, but I think, you know, pricing is one that has been on our Google Doc list of things we want to talk about for a long time. And I think that it would be a super valuable conversation. I know when I look at pricing my own work, it initially was looking at what would be a reasonable, not insulting amount of money to make per year. And then whittling that down to, by the time I do the social media and the advertising and the other things, how many hours could I possibly work per day? And, and then figuring out what's my hourly minimum rate that I need to charge to respect myself at the end of the day when I sell a quilt. And then anytime you sell work, especially engaging in the art world, artists a lot of times only get half of that money uh, because the gallery gets the other half. And so then you have to, whatever your minimum price is, you have to double that as the retail price. And then I found finding a structure, once I have enough quilts priced, I can look and say, this is what a $3,000 quilt looks like. This is what a $10,000 quilt looks like. This is seven, et cetera. And I can just see where things kind of slot in because that's where my raise comes in. Maybe I'm faster at sewing now than I was six years ago when I first started pricing quilts. And, and that's like a place to add in a raise. And it's been weird trying to figure out how to change the pricing when I shifted from machine piecing to hand piecing, because that takes a hugely different amount of time to make a quilt. But um, that's the tiniest window into how I approach pricing things. It's more now like there are different price categories and like quilts go with like prices. And I think that's also a nod from the painting world. Um, a painter friend of mine here in Wisconsin was sharing that he always prices things based on size, based on being part of the same series, rather than this one was 46 hours to make, this one was <laughs> 79 hours to make, that that um, you know, just isn't, it's more part of the, if, if we'll dig in, the craft world pricing versus art world pricing. And if we want to get prices that are connected to paintings, it has to be more of that model. I, I, I think it's really important also to note that um, when we say 10,000 is cheap for a painting, uh, we're talking about the 1% of painters. I've yeah there's not a lot of painters who get even 10,000. So True. there's just a lot more painters than quilters who sell quilts. So we, we try to think about the art world in a way that because the articles in the New York Times aren't gonna be like, a painter sold a painting for $570. Let's talk about it. It's like, no, somebody auctioned a painting for a million bucks, that's gonna make a headline. So we're looking at, you yeah. know, the Brad Pitt of painting. We're not looking at Joe Schmo who, you know, who's who's trying to make a painting and thinks he's entitled to 10 grand. Uh, there's a lot of problematic value in the art world. And that has to do with um, how you are presented and who told who to buy your work. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that I tell people as a way to start thinking about selling work is how much is it worth for you to part with? Yeah. And sometimes it's, Sometimes, and, and like, there's a lot of goals in selling. Is your goal to get more of your work out there to develop a collector base, and then you can increase your price and prove that it's worth it because you have more pieces in the world, then sell for less. If your goal is to prove that you're the most valuable quilter ever, triple your prices, don't sell anything for a decade, and then you're gonna be the most highest paid quilter that's ever made, right? Get a day job. So there's a lot of different rubrics and points in the, in, in the way to make pricing. Uh, uh, Heidi's way is a really good way if you need to do it as kind of your day job, but there's just a lot of weird politics to pricing in the world of art that are uh, both unfortunate and um, <laughs> sort of insidious that I think 
uh, have to be taken into consideration as you're working on pricing. Uh, the other thing is you can never go down. If you go down on your pricing, um, you are telling everyone who's bought that work before that their work is less valuable now. So there's just all of these bits and tiers and conversations to going about pricing things that are, are, are things that aren't often uh, put into the rubric of, of, of pricing and conversations about it. I could hear more. I feel like, have you gone into that in your Luke University? No? <laughs> no, no, I haven't. <laughs> Uh, that one, you know, I would love to have that a longer conversation about that for sure. I think that would be a really interesting one to share different people who, who, because I think in the world that we are, there's a lot of people who have supplemental, uh, you know, patterns and teaching and, and fabric lines and, and things that are sort of, but, you know, maybe that's their preference. Maybe, you know, I know people whose job it is to make patterns who have to make fabric to supplement that? I know people who just want to make fabric who have to make hoodies for the, you know, there's just all of this kind of stuff. So it'd be interesting to get kind of a, a panel of people whose, whose preference is different parts of the making process uh, and kind of talk about their business strategy. You know, it makes me think when you're saying that, um, I finally got to meet one of my mentors in person years back who, well, when I was in SCAD and my, professor was teaching us how to quilt, Pamela Wiley brought Denise Schmidt in when Denise Schmidt's business was just about three years or four years old. It would have been like 2004, um, 2005 maybe. Denise taught her, her like iconic workshop, which she was, she's been, it's never changed. It's that, you know, improv quilting and how to build an improv quilt block from just pulling blindly from scraps of fabric in a bag. And we learned that and it was pivotal for me and I never forgot her. And she was just as influential to me as like the G's bins are, you know, quilts are. And it just set me on this path of like excited and limitless ideas. Um, and I got to teach with her and um, slow stitching retreat up in Maine with um, a group and we had lunches and we got to like talk and it was just, two years ago and meeting her, you know, she's one of those that have gone that traditional route of being a business, a qu making quilting a business with selling patterns, designing fabric and selling quilts, you know, um, commission quilts and the likes. And she and I sat next to each other and I said, I want to like get there. You know, I want to do that. Give me some advice. And she like shared so candidly that like, She's like, and I want to get to where you're at, making one of a kind quilts and doing that, you know, where, how I want to do it in like a cottage, you know, by the Cape, you know, and it's just like, oh, like, <laughs> okay. Like we are looking at each other from opposite sides of the fence and seeing the value that each of us have. And I had to see my own value and like where I'm at in my own practice. And um, I personally am so inspired by Zach, you're, commissions that you are working with you're like going into like the deepest wells of our hearts with those clients and I can't even imagine how you would talk about pricing but at the same time it's like weddings and funerals are where people are willing to spend <laughs> but at the same time it's like if you have to sustain it as a business some some of that is interesting like money is interesting and it doesn't matter and it does but I miss I miss that uh, commission work is interesting because it's a guaranteed paycheck, which is a really good way of starting out because you're getting on a track system of monthly income and um, you're working and the client is expecting the work and it's structured and you're delivering and it's so like, you know, good. It's like a, it's on, you're on track. Um, I got to a point in my work, I couldn't take commissions because I wasn't in control over my free time. I mean, I, there's always an answer. You could, I could have done daycare or a nanny, but I didn't want to spend that money. I wanted to keep my kids home. And so I stopped commission work because it stressed me out to have someone else on my calendar that I was needing to, you know, provide, uh, you know, finished work for. So I don't know, I miss it. But I also am like, whoa, here I am making whatever I want to make, hoping it sells and selling it. 
I mean, I haven't made anything for like nine months, but like, you know, and when I get back to it, um, so it's like, there's value on both sides, but the commissions, when I hear you talk about it, Zach, I miss, I miss it. I miss that connection with that inspiration that you, I've just like following you on Instagram too. Your work is fueled by these, these, these connections and these relationships. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really astute observation. I draw, and I draw a lot of energy from the people that I make work for. And I feel like um, there's a lot I could say about that. Yeah. But maybe I'll save that for part two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> part, two, part two, part two, part two. Yeah, do we want a part pricing. two on pricing? <laughs> okay, because we've been talking about yeah. pricing okay. as in the art world, but there's also who are we trying to sell to? Yeah. Right. And that's that's part two. So yeah. I got some things I could say about that. All right. Yeah, I Maura, think... let's, let's, let's make, yeah, you have to agree online live right now to do a part two with us. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> promise. Let's, hold Are on. we doing a pinky Please. promise? Pricing is part two. <laughs> part two. Well, I think I business assume, practice. I can't assume that you were talking about me as the guest for part two. You could have been inviting oh, wow. someone else in for part two. <laughs> we are talking about you. <laughs> we're talking about you. Uh, I say business practice part two that includes pricing, that includes marketing, that includes managing social media and your time as a human in the world, yeah. uh, which is all yes. just stuff. Oh, so. sweet. Business yes. practice. That is a great phrase. Yes, sir. Let's do it. All yeah, right. chat's okay. blowing up. Yeah, Everyone's yeah. riled. Uh, we'll figure out how to get everyone on our list invited. <laughs> yeah, sorry, for, sorry for whatever slip up that was. It, folks didn't. Some folks didn't get their emails. But um, I have a sense I know what the problem is. So we'll fix it before next month. Okay. Any last closing words, folks? Um, no worries about the email because this was recorded. Yes, exactly. Yeah, on YouTube, the conversation can continue on YouTube in the chat, in the comments there. Um, so don't be shy in that space. And uh, we'll be sending out a thank you email to everybody as well. Yep. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, thank, thank, you. Three, four hours. thank you, everybody. Fired up. Thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. More thank you. on the line for just a second. Okay. We usually do a little wrap up. Okay. Have a nice day.